one of these days I will remember how to set this camera for manual focus and I'll just focus it once and you won't get all this fuzzy as it goes in and out of focus occasionally. That day is not today. A few more problems, what the hell, what an opener. Okay, a few more problems about kinematics. Um, so same stuff we've been talking about. Kinematics just has to do with motion. We're not talking about what causes the motion. And in specific, we're focusing almost entirely on constant acceleration motion because it's a special case that actually kind of shows up in real world. There are places where constant acceleration is a bad approximation, but it's often a decent approximation. Gravity near the surface of the Earth, very good approximation as long as you can ignore air resistance. So this is a realistic thing to be talking about. And it's also something we're capable of talking about, so that's kind of a nice mix. So let's start with the first problem. It says, if you throw a ball upwards at speed v0, the ball reaches a height h. Um, now here's the thing, when you, when you read that, if you throw a ball upwards at speed v0, the ball reaches a height h. I have given you v0. No, what? there's no number here, but v0 is a known, and h is a known. So what this means is, basically, um, one thing, let's just assume that your height is tiny, maybe I should say kick a ball upwards, like soccer style. It starts at speed v0, and it reaches a height h. I'm going to draw a little dot of that. That's as high as it goes. And then the question is, how hard must you throw it, i.e. at what speed? So how hard you throw a ball. Oh, look, I'm left-handed now. What, what we mean by how hard you throw it, really? Well, what is it you control in terms of the kinematics? It's the speed that it leaves your hand. That's when we talk about how hard you throw a ball, that's what we're talking about. How hard must you throw it in order to reach a height of 2h? And again, I'm just going to leave out the person's height in hopes that it's small compared to the whole h. Otherwise, we'd have to take that into account. So the question is, what speed do we need to go for the ball to get up to a height of 2h? Well, all right. So let's just think about what's going on here. Let's start. Let's define some axes um, just so we can talk about it. I'm going to go ahead and use the y-axis as vertical, because that's often traditional. I could use x-axis as vertical, that's okay. Nothing's moving in x, nothing's moving in z. I'll go ahead and draw the third dimension there, because it's real. We only have y to worry about. And so now we know that the equations we have to deal with are vy equals vy0. Uh, well, I'm going to write it like this. Plus ayt is equal to v0 minus gt, so vy0 is the same as v0 at least on the left here, on the right it's something different, and then the acceleration is g in both cases. We also know that y is equal to y0, which I'm going to say is 0, we're starting from the ground. The other way you could do is think about h as the height above where you let go of it, then that means the same thing. Plus vy0t plus one-half ayt squared. So this is that standard, what I've done is I've taken the standard vector equation, I'll write it out, that r vector equals r0 vector plus v0 vector t plus one-half a vector t squared. This is a full vector, I can't plug numbers into this, or if I do, I have to plug full vectors, three numbers each one. I can't even plug single values like h into this. I have said, okay, nothing's moving in x, nothing's moving in z, so the x and z components of this are uninteresting. I'll pull out the y component, and that's what this is, it's just the y component of that. And of course that is v0 minus, uh, v0, sorry, t, minus one half g t squared, because I plug in negative g for a y. g is the magnitude of gravity. Gravity is pointing in the negative y direction, and so that's why a y is negative g. Okay, and in fact, if you really want it to be anal, I could say here that the acceleration is equal to minus g in the y hat direction, which you could also write as 0 comma minus g comma 0. Right? That's what the full acceleration is, g again being the magnitude of gravity. It's just the number 9.8. It's not negative 9.8 meters per second squared. It's just 9.8 meters per second squared. But we're not going to put that in because we don't have any other numbers. So I'm going to leave g as g. Don't put in your 9.8 meters per second squared unless you put in all your other numbers, because it just makes the whole thing messy. Okay, good, that's what we know. So, all right, what do we even do with this? What are we asking? Well, one thing we do know is, is that in a certain amount of time, it's going to reach a certain height, 
And what is where it's at its highest? Well, think about what the ball is doing. It's going up, 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 down, 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 down. When it's as high as it gets, it's no longer moving up, because if it was moving up, it would get higher. It's not moving down, because if it's moving down, it would have been higher. So therefore, very briefly, for just the instant, the speed is zero, and the, therefore the velocity is zero. If the magnitude of a vector is zero, the whole vector is zero, and each component is zero. So at the top, we have vy is equal to zero, and y is equal to h on the left side. So once we've done that, we can now, uh, let's go ahead and put that in. We have zero is equal to v zero minus g t, or in this case, solving the algebra, t is equal to v zero over g. Do not take this as the t equation that you can use for t. This is for this problem. Sometimes other problems have a similar t, but don't start with the t ever. Start with this stuff and work out what t is. You get different t's in different problems. Now that we know that, I can plug that in here. I know that h has to be equal to v zero times v zero over g minus one half g times v zero over g quantity squared, which is v zero squared over g minus one half. I'm gonna have a v zero squared again on the top. g and g squared, one of them cancels like that. And when I have something minus half of something, that's the same as just half of that something. So it's v zero squared over two g. All right, that's as high as it gets. So we know here that the height, this h, we can actually work out what it is, is equal to v0 squared over 2g. And now the question is, if I throw a ball and I want it to get twice as high, how fast do I have to throw it? Well, okay, there's a couple of ways you could do this. I'm going to start with the faster way. And the faster way is that you look at this. I already know the relationship between h and v0. So what if initial velocity is equal to, well, instead of initial velocity, it says, what if I replace this with 2h? I need 2h is going to equal, well, I can multiply both sides by 2, v0 squared over 2g, right? That's very exciting. I'm going to rewrite this a slightly different way in a way that's going to look perverse. I'm going to write it as root 2 times v0 squared over 2g. And the reason I wrote that now is that I have 2h, this is the height, is equal to a thing squared over 2g. Well, the height it goes is the thing that you've squared. So this says that the speed that you have to throw it at is equal to root 2 times v0. And root 2 is about 1.4. So you only have to throw it about 40% harder to get it to go twice as high. Now, if you thought that was a too fast way to do it, Let's do it another way. So what I'm going to do is keep this one. I'm going to go back to here and say at the top now, we're going to have y is equal to 2h, because that's the height we want to go to. But we no longer start at v0, but we start at, we don't know. We start at v question mark. How hard do I have to throw it to get the new height? All right, so knowing that, Right, I start with the same equations, but vy0 is now v question mark here. Knowing that, now I can solve it again. So I do the same thing here. I take this, uh, this first one here, and I have at the top vy is 0 is equal to v question mark minus gt. So therefore, t again is equal to v question mark over g. It's not the same t as before, because v question mark is not the same as v0. I can plug that in here. I want a better red pen. I'm sure I have one. Um, I don't know where it is, so I'm going to just switch to blue so you'll be able to read what I'm writing. This pen's not in great shape. Go to this one. The new height, I want to get to 2h, because y equals 2h at this time is equal to v question mark times v question mark over g minus 1 half g times t, which is v question mark over g squared. So I'll get v question mark squared over g minus one half of v question mark squared divided by g. One of the g's cancels the g squared. Again, I will get v question mark squared over 2g. What do I do with this? Well, v question mark is what I'm after. So let's solve this for v question mark. It says that v question mark squared, I'm going to multiply both sides by 2g, is 4gh 
or V question mark, is 2 times the square root of GH. Over here, because now what's really interesting is to compare V question mark to V0. How hard do I have to throw it? At what speed? Well, this is an answer, but let's actually say how hard do I have to compare it compared to how hard I was throwing it before. That's the thing that's most interesting. If you think about, I threw it that hard, how much harder do I have to throw it? So this, if I solve this for V0, I get V0 is equal to the square root of 2 times GH, right? So I multiply both sides by 2G then take a square root of both sides. And so now I can think V question mark divided by V0 is going to equal 2GH with GH under a square root divided by the square root of 2GH. Well, the square roots GH cancel. That's 2 over the square root of 2, which is the same as the square root of 2, because 2 is also the square root of 2 times the square root of 2. That's what we had before. So this is, I have to throw it root 2 harder to get it to go twice as high. If you have a way of actually measuring initial speeds, you could try this experiment. Actually measuring that initial speed is, is not terribly easy, but we could do it in the lab with photo gates and stuff. Maybe I'll try and set up an experiment like that. That's the first problem. Suppose the farthest you can throw a baseball on Earth is a distance d. How far can you throw it on the moon where gravity is only one sixth as strong? All right, so this is asking, I'm on the Earth. I throw a baseball, it lands a distance D away. What does that really tell me? Well, all right, so, so what's, what, what is the thing here that's controlling this is how hard I throw the ball. I don't know that speed V0, but given the distance D, I could figure that out. That's gonna be the same on the moon under the assumption that I'm just standing there and not in a spacesuit that makes it hard for the throw, whatever. We'll just assume, I'm holding my breath, I'm good at that. And I throw the ball on the moon. Um, I will throw it at the same speed. It's going to go farther because gravity is smaller. So how far does it go? Well, all right, let's just start with the Earth. And this is very much like problems we've already done. It's very much like the Napoleon problem. I throw the ball. Again, we'll assume I throw it from the ground. Boom, it goes a distance D. Um, all right. I'm throwing at speed v0. Let's go ahead and assume this is a 45 degree angle because we know from lab that the, you get the greatest range by throwing at 45 degrees. So we're just going to go ahead and assume that now, that that's the angle we're throwing at. I didn't tell you that, but we'll assume that because we know. We're ignoring air resistance, and let's figure out what v0 is given d. We also know that the acceleration, I guess I have to define my axes. I'll define x that way and y that way. We know the acceleration is 0, comma minus g comma zero on Earth, where it's just g, 9.8 meters per second squared. So we'll do the same thing we always do. Um, we have this equation, r equals r0 plus v0 t plus 1 half a t squared. We've got a, we know that r0 is zero, and v0, well, we have to do the same thing that we always do. And this is theta here, and theta is not always going to be this angle. Sometimes it'll be that angle. In this case, it doesn't matter so much because it's 45 degrees. And it turns out that if you take a sine or a cosine of 45 degrees, you get the same thing, V0x is V0 divided by the square root of 2. V0y is V0 divided by the square root of 2. The other way you could have seen that is because it's 45 degrees, you know that V0x is equal to v0y. You can also use the Pythagorean theorem. v0x squared plus v0y squared is equal to v0 squared. 45 degrees, v0x, v0y have to be the same, so v0x squared plus another v0x squared. So 2v0x squared is v0 squared, or v0x squared equals v0 squared over 2, or v0x is equal to v0 over the square root of 2. Either way of figuring it out, we now know what v0x and v0y are. So I'm going to put in v0 is v0 vector is v0 magnitude divided by square root of 2 comma v0, I thought my little serifs there, v0 magnitude divided by the square root of 2 comma 0. Nothing's moving in the z-axis. 
So we know all the things we can plug in. The x component gives us that x as a function of time is equal to x0, which is 0, plus v0x, which is v0 over the square root of 2 times t, plus 1 half ax, and ax is 0. So we're done with that. So we know that the time it takes to get a distance x away, because it's just moving along steadily in x, is going to be equal to root 2x over v0. And then what we're going to do is plug in x equals d, and I'll call that time t sub d, the time it takes to go distance d, is root 2 times d over v0. And then we also have the y component of this equation, y is equal to 0 because r0 component, r0 is 0 for everybody, plus v0y, which is also v0 over the square root of 2 t minus one half g because a y is negative g times t squared and then we know and here's the thing is that to be at the time when it hits the ground when x is at distance d y hits the ground again so y has to be zero because this is it's all at one time because the ball is where it is at a given time zero has to equal v zero over root two times the time when x is at d td, so I'm going to plug that in, root 2d over v0, hey look at that, all kinds of stuff is going to cancel, minus 1 half times g times root 2d over v0 squared, so the root 2's cancel, the v0's cancel, I get d minus 1 half g times 2d squared over v0 squared, or in this case, the maximum range that I get Let's see if I can simplify this. Ah, not by a lot. Uh, a little bit, yeah. Let's just add one half. Uh, the twos cancel, right? G D squared over V. So I don't need that one half because it canceled. V zero squared is equal to D. What I did is I added this to the left side over here. So we became G D squared over V zero squared equals D. And there we got it. Oh no, not yet, because I have to divide by D. So I have to do two more steps of algebra. I'm going to. Uh, let's do it like this. I'm going to divide both sides by d squared, so I get g over v0 squared is equal to 1 over d, because that's what d over d squared is. Oh, I want a d. Let's turn it upside down. It tells me that d is equal to v0 squared over g. That's the maximum range that I can get. That's on Earth. So let's call this d sub e for the... I don't know, d. We defined d sub e as the distance on Earth. Now suppose we did the whole thing again only on the moon. On the moon, ay is equal to 0, comma, minus g over 6, comma, 0, because gravity is 1 6 as strong on the moon. It still points down. So what's going to happen is I'll do this whole thing, but everywhere I have a g, I will replace it with a g over 6. So I can just say on the moon, my distance, I'll say d sub m for distance on the moon. So dm is equal to v0 squared divided by g over 6 is what I would have had if I had done this whole thing through again, but everywhere I had g, I replaced it with g over 6. That's the same as 6 v0 squared over g. That's equal to 6d. So I can throw a ball six times as far on the moon as I can on the Earth. Now you might say, oh, well, that was obvious. Gravity is 1 sixth, so therefore you can throw a ball six times as far. Um, no, that logic doesn't work. I mean, yes, it does work, but you have to work it out because if you had gone, look at the previous problem we just did. Oh, if you want to throw it twice as high, you must need to throw it twice as hard would have been wrong because remember, you only throw it 1.4 times as hard to throw it twice as high. So it's not always obvious that a doubling of one thing is going to lead to a doubling of another. It did in this case, but we had to actually work it out to make sure that it really did. That's the second problem. Okay, more hockey pucks with rockets, because that's what we do. <clears throat> X-axis, Y-axis. A hockey puck with a small rocket attached to it. Starts at position R0 equals 2.5 meters minus 1.3 meters comma 0. So it's out here, 2.5 minus 1.3, that's where it is. Here is the R, R0 vector. That's where the hockey puck starts. It is moving with initial velocity, v0 equals minus 2.5 meters per second, y hat. Remember, y hat is 100, so if it's minus 2.5 meters per second, y hat, 
that's the direction of V0. And finally, the rocket engines provide enough thrust to accelerate the hockey puck at 3.5 meters per second squared. That tells us that the magnitude of the acceleration is 3.5 meters per second squared. The rocket engines point so that where the hockey puck starts, the acceleration points towards the origin. So what that means is when it's here, the acceleration is in that direction. It points towards the origin, which means points exactly opposite R0. First question, what is the acceleration of the hockey puck? Your temptation is to say, it is 3.5 meters per second squared and think you are done. That is wrong. Acceleration is a vector. So when I'm saying, what is the acceleration of the hockey puck? Well, okay, you could say, 3.5 meters per second squared towards the origin, and you wouldn't be wrong, but you'd still have work to do before being able to do the subsequent problems. So let's work out all three components of that vector. How the heck do I do that? Well, I know that A is pointing exactly opposite R0. How do I say that mathematically? Think about what a unit vector is. The unit vector is a vector with, with no dimensions and unit length that points in the same direction as whichever vector it's the unit vector of. Um, sometimes unit vectors are called directionals. So R0 hat, the unit vector R0 hat, points in the same direction as R0, but it has length 1. And remember, the way we define it is R0, and we divide it by the magnitude of R0. And here's the thing. We are saying that the acceleration is pointing opposite R0 hat. So A hat has to equal minus R0 hat. That says, remember, you multiply a vector by negative 1, you get the vector in the opposite direction. So that says that a hat has to be the opposite of r naught hat, which means that a hat is going to be minus r x, sorry, r naught x over r naught comma minus r naught y over r naught comma minus r naught z over r naught because this is minus r naught hat, right? R naught x over r naught r naught y over r naught r naught z over r naught is r naught hat, and I put all the negative signs up. Well, so let's figure that out. So first of all, what is R0? R0 is going to be equal to the square root of R0 x squared plus, what a terrible looking plus, plus R0 y squared plus R0 z squared, which is, so here I'm looking at R0, 2.5 meters squared plus negative 1.3, and I'm not even going to put the negative sign in because I know when I square it, it goes away, plus 0. And so that I have to do on my calculator. All right, so that's equal to 2.8178 meters. We don't have that many significant figures, but I'm going to use this in subsequent calculations, so I'm keeping extra digits. Always keep extra digits for numbers you use in subsequent calculations. So now that I know that, I can figure out a hat is equal to minus 2.5 meters divided by 2.8178 meters, comma, plus 1.3 meters, because R not Y, well, it's in the paper, you can look at it. Why don't I write it down over here just for reference? So R not is 2.5 meters, comma, minus 1.3 meters, comma, zero, and V not is equal to minus 2.5 meters per second Y hat. Okay, so I've got that reference there. So 1.3, finish what I was doing here, 8178 meters, comma, zero. I don't have to write the divided. Okay, so stick that into my calculator one by one. Okay, and when I'm done sticking that into my calculator, I've written it up, minus 0.8872, wrote it right, said it wrong. Try these numbers in your calculator, that's what you will get. That is a hat. And so we know that A is equal to A magnitude times A hat is 3.5 meters per second squared times this, minus 0 0.8872, comma 0 0.4614, comma 0. So I can do that calculation. All right, and when that calculation is done, I get this. Multiply this out. That is what the acceleration is. I'm just going to check really quickly, make sure that if I take the magnitude of this, I get what I expect. So I'm squaring these two numbers, I add them, and I take a square root, and I get 3.5. Good. So um, that's right. So now I know, I'm going to write it over here for reference to too many significant figures, 
1053, comma, 1.6147, 0 meters per second squared. That's the acceleration, but given the number of sig figs I have, I only have a couple sig figs. There was multiplications and additions and stuff, but these are good to the tenth place. All of these are going to be good also to two sig figs for the tenth place. Minus 3.1 comma 1.6 comma 0 meters per second squared. That's the acceleration. So just to review the way I got this, I was told the acceleration, when the, where the hockey puck started, the acceleration was pointing back towards the origin. That means it points exactly opposite R0. I figured out the unit vector that gives me the direction of R0. Okay, where, did, where was that vector? Here it is. Well, I didn't actually figure it all the way out, but I knew that the acceleration's unit vector was going to be the negative of that. So here I got the acceleration's unit vector. Then to get the full acceleration vector, I just multiplied the magnitude of the acceleration by its unit vector. That gives me the acceleration. So that's part A. Next, after one, five seconds, what is the velocity and speed of the hockey puck? This is a constant acceleration. The rocket is not always pointing towards the origin. It's always pointing in that direction. So as it goes, it's going to go, uh, let's see, it's going to go like that and make that noise. But the acceleration is always going to be pointing that way. The rocket's shooting out its fuel that way. So for this, I can just say V is equal to V0 plus a t. So therefore, v is going to equal 0 minus 2.5 meters per second, 0, plus the acceleration. And now I have, I'm have i going back to keeping the extra digits. That's very important. Meters per second squared, um, 1.6147 meters per second squared, 0 times 5 seconds. Okay, so now I plug this into my calculator, and remember the way I do that is I add 0 minus 3.1053 times 5, and I'll get x. I'll do minus 2.5 plus 1.6147 times 5. So I'll stick that into my calculator. Okay, and when I'm done putting these numbers into my calculator, this is what I get at t equals 5 seconds. All right, next question. After five seconds, what is the position of the hockey puck? Here I'm going to use R equals R0 plus V0T plus one half AT squared. Now, two mistakes I have seen people make I want to warn you about. The first one is saying, oh, now that we know the velocity, I should just be able to use this, right? Plug, done. I've got V. I can put in V here and done. No, this equation right here only works if a is zero. In fact, it's exactly the same as this equation when a is zero. So you can't use that. Next, make sure that you put in v zero here. Right? This is the, the velocity at time t equals zero. Don't put in this v. I don't need this v anymore. That was the answer. Turns out I don't need this anymore. So I'm going to erase this. And this is the thing I have to do, and I'm going to write out the calculation I have to do. So the position of the hockey puck at t equals 5 seconds is r0. r0 is 2.5 meters minus 1.3 meters 0 plus v0t, and v0 is 0, minus 2.5 meters per second, 0, times t is 5 seconds, plus 1 half times a minus 3.1053 meters per second squared, 1.6147 meters per second squared, 0 times 5 seconds squared. All right, that's the calculation I have to do. I'm doing all three at once. I'll do the x component, then the y component. The z component is trivial, so I will do those. Right, oh, and when I'm done doing those calculations, this is the position I get at t equals 5 seconds. So you see it's going way negative in x. It's going like this. It started here. It goes, and it gets about to something like there. I know, that was stupid. My hand's way off. I'm like, look at that. Look where I'm pointing. Right here off the screen. Anyway, whatever. You get the idea. That's R. Now comes the hard question. Does the hockey puck reach the origin? If so, after how long, how long after it starts moving, uh, poorly stated, how long after the time I gave you right here that was the beginning time, at what t, does it reach the origin? How do I figure that out? Well, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to start with this. 
I'm going to break it into two components. And I'm going to start with the x component. So x is equal to x0 plus v0 x t plus 1 half a x t squared. And I'm going to ask at what t is x equals 0? I can figure that out. I put in 0 for x. x0 is 2.5 meters. v0 x is 0 plus 0 plus 1 half and a x is Wow, I really don't like myself right now because um, I was about to do algebra with numbers. That's a bad thing. I'm just going to put in x is equal to x0 plus 1 half a x t squared. The one number I'm putting in is that v0 x is 0 because that will make my life a whole lot easier. And I'm going to put in that x equals 0 and figure out at what time does this happen? Well, okay, here's the time where it happens. Minus x0 is 1 half a x t squared or minus 2x0 over ax is t squared, or it happens at t is equal to the square root of minus 2x0 over ax. And now you're all stressed, thinking, wait, that's a square root of a negative number. Well, not necessarily. x0 and ax, those numbers, one of them may be negative. In fact, they are. So minus 2, x0 is 2.5 meters. And then ax, oh look, here's our negative number, minus 3.1053 meters per second squared. The meters cancels meters. I have 1 over second squared in the denominator, which is second squared in the numerator. It's under a square root. The units work. So I can do this calculation. Okay. And when I've done that calculation, I get 1.27 seconds. So the camera stopped recording on me. So I'm going to redo this last bit here that it didn't record. So what I had just worked out is that x equals 0, t equals 1.27 seconds. Now I'm going to ask the question, what is y at the time when x is 0? If I get y equals 0, then x equals 0 and y equals 0 at the same time. So let's figure this out. So y is equal to y0, and now here I don't have to solve any algebra, so I'm ready to plug in numbers. So what is y0? Minus 1.3 meters plus v0y is minus 2.5 meters per second times the time, 1.27 seconds. I wish I had kept a couple extra digits, but oh well. Life is like that sometimes. Plus 1 half ay is 1.6147 meters per second squared times 1.27 seconds squared. I can calculate this number, so I will do that. Oh. Okay, and when I'm done doing that calculation, I get y equals minus 3.2 meters. In other words, it does not cross the origin. If you think about what it does, here's x, here's y. It starts here. It starts moving that way, because that's v0, but it's accelerating that way. So it starts moving this way, but it's accelerating this way. It's going to move like that and get faster and faster and go over that way. And so when at the time when x is 0, what does x being 0 equal mean? What does it mean when x is 0? It means it's along the y-axis, because everywhere along the y-axis, x is 0. When x is 0, y is minus 3.2 meters. So here's where it crosses the y-axis. It does not cross the origin. Now, if the acceleration weren't always constant in that way, it might loop back. But in this case, we know that once it's gone this way, it's never coming back. It's just accelerating out that way. Off it goes. Bye. All right, that is the second, third. I wish I knew how to count. It would make life easier. That was the third problem. In the last problem, we will be engaging in some unsafe driving. The basic idea is you have a, a drawbridge, and you're driving your car across it. And the drawbridge goes ding, 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 and starts to raise, and you say, oh, hell, I'm not supposed to even be on the drawbridge. I guess that's why I shouldn't have driven through that little... Uh, chopper, wood thingy, what are those things called? Whatever, the gate thing. <laughs> Shouldn't have driven through that. Guess that was foolish. All I have to do now is fall out into the water and die. Or I could gun it and drive really fast and jump. Now, kids, do not do this at home. Do this in your car. No, no, sorry. Do not do this in real life. Do this at home. If you're playing Grand Theft Auto, then it's okay. No problem, right? You crash your car. Whatever. Reload or go to the hospital, and uh, whatever happens. Uh, do not do this in real life, but let's calculate it. So here's the deal. Your car, you're going to go at an angle of 20 degrees, and you need to clear 8 meters. What does this really mean? 
Well, here's what happens. You're starting here. You want to land there. And your trajectory is going to look something like that. In fact, I'm not even going to draw that. Your trajectory is going to look something like that. When you get down to the same height where you started, and now we're replacing the car with a little point. If I had to do this for real, we might have to consider the fact that, well, never mind, all kinds of stuff could get complicated. The car could start tumbling. Bad stuff could happen. We're going to consider the car just to the point. We're going to say, by the time the point has gone 8 meters horizontally, it can't have fallen down more than back to where it started. Right? So if, it, if you weren't going fast enough and you jump, your trajectory might look like that. And that's bad because into the water you go. So uh, you want to make sure that you've got at least enough speed that you go that far. So how far do you go? Well, all right. We have the same thing that we always have. We have the two equations, v is equal to v0 plus at. Is this a constant acceleration situation? Yes. Acceleration is, let's go ahead and define our axes, x and y, and let's put the origin right here where the car starts. That'll make life relatively easy. So given our definition of, of axes, a is 0 minus g0, and we can also use r is equal to r0 plus v0t plus 1 half a t squared. We're going to define the origin where the car starts, so r0 is 0. v0 is there, we'll come back to that in a moment, and a is that. So let's come back to v0, it is now that moment. Here's v0. This is, I'm going to define theta to be 20 degrees. Why am I doing that? Because I don't want to put numbers in too soon. It will be easier to carry around a theta than write 20 degrees over and over again. This here is v naught cosine theta. This here is v naught sine theta. And I know that because adjacent over hypotenuse has to equal cosine theta. And sure enough, if I divide v naught out, I get cosine theta and so forth. So now I know that v0, the x component, is positive. Is v naught cosine theta, comma v naught sine theta, comma zero. Okay. Next, how long is the car in the air? Remember what it's doing. He's launching himself here, and he goes through. I'll figure out v naught cosine theta. Well, given how much time do I have? How far do I have to get? Eight meters. I better be going fast enough to get that eight meters and how much time I have. What defines how much time I have? Well, how long it takes me to arc up and down. That depends entirely on the vertical direction, on gravity. So let's start with the vertical direction. So we want, we're going to end at the same height as where we started. So you're going to end at y equals zero, has to equal y zero, which is zero, plus v zero y, which in this case is v zero sine theta t, plus one half times a y, which is minus g t squared. Now, notice I put parentheses around the g. That's important. A bunch of you I've seen writing it as minus one half g t squared. When you write it like this, this says to me, take the number one half and subtract g t squared from it, which you can't even do because the units don't even work on that. So make sure if you want to multiply by negative something, you use parentheses like this to make sure it's clear what you're doing. Great. Now I'm going to add the one half g t squared to both sides. That's equal to v naught sine theta t, divide both sides by t. Now I'm going to multiply both sides by 2 and divide both sides by g, and I get t equals 2 v naught sine theta over g here. That's how long in this problem it's going to take for the car to go, do, 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 go from here to here, or to go from, do, 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 from here to here if his speed wasn't fast enough. Right? The higher the speed, the longer the time. That's a good thing. So we know that the time that it's going to take to get back down to the same height where you left, right? So the time it takes to get to the height of the drawbridge here, I shouldn't have drawn that, it should ruin the picture, whatever. The time it takes to get to the height of the drawbridge is that. Now, in that time, I had better cross the distance of the drawbridge. So I'm now going to pull out the x component of this. So x final is 8 meters, let's call that d. So d had better equal x initial, 0, plus vx, which is v0 cosine theta, times t, and I'm going to put in t, 2 v0 sine theta over g, plus 1 half at squared and ax is 0. 
So the distance that we go, this should start to look familiar. This is basically the same problem as the Napoleon Cannon problem. Right? That's the distance we go equals V0. Um, let's actually collect a bunch of stuff together. Notice I have V0 times V0. I'm going to pull the 2 out front. 2 V0 squared cosine theta sine theta over G. All right. What I'm really asking about is V0. Let's solve for it. So V0 squared. Multiply both sides by G. Divide both sides by 2 cosine theta sine theta or V0. What this really is is the minimum V0. If V0 is bigger than this, that will make D bigger. That's okay. Your car can go, oh yeah, check me out. And that's fine. You still make it across the bridge. So this is really the minimum V0 that we're calculating. Let's calculate it. It's going to be the square root of 9.8 meters per second squared times 8, 8.0 meters divided by 2 times cosine 20 degrees times sine 20 degrees. All right, stick those numbers in ye olde calculator. Okay, I've put them on a calculator. I get, this is it, 11 meters per second. I'm kind of disappointed by that. Because 11, 8 meters? I'm dubious. I'm going to check my, uh, check my math because this sounds really slow to me. 11 meters per second, 1609.4 is the number of meters in a mile. So I divide by that and I multiply by 3600 seconds in an hour times and I get 25 miles per hour? Really? Jeez, let me do that on my friggin' bicycle. Um, put that on my tombstone. Anyway. I'll check my numbers. I'll put up yellow, little yellow text if it's wrong, but if not, hey, that's what it is. Turns out uh, jumping those drawbridges isn't so dangerous after all. Go and do it. No, don't. Stick with doing it in Grand Theft Auto. Um, that's the that's that's our that's our stuff for today. Good luck with the exam on Tuesday. Ha ha. Mm. Yeah.